can imagine my going to jail at age 60. Perhaps something good will come of all this. I believe that God has a reason for everything, including this. Captain Hardigan, a German officer, was put in charge of Titus's case and began his interrogation with this question. Why have you disobeyed the regulations? As a Catholic, I could have done nothing differently. You are a saboteur. Your church is trying to sabotage the orders of the occupying powers to endanger the national peace and to prevent our philosophy from reaching the Dutch people. We must object to anything or any philosophy which is not in line with Catholic doctrine. Three days later, Hardigan filed a report to Berlin. Bransman's activity endangers the prestige of the German Empire, the national socialistic ideas, and I believe he intends to undermine the unity of the Dutch people. It seems justifiable, therefore, to take Father Bransma into custody for a considerable time. I believe that Bransma is an enemy of the German mission, and it is shown quite clearly in his past writings. Though I am here by myself in prison, my Lord has never been closer to me. I even sing, though softly. I remember St. Teresa's famous words. Let nothing disturb thee, let nothing frighten thee. All passes away. God alone abides. God is always there. Captain Hardigan continued his interrogations. The evidence he compiled was not favorable to Titus. In a final letter to his superiors, he said, Bransma feels he must protect Christianity against our regime. I regard him as very dangerous and suggest we not let him free before the end of the war. Titus spent several weeks in his prison cell at Schwenigen. He wrote poetry, started a biography of St. Teresa of Avila, composed a series of meditations, wrote two booklets, and spent much time kneeling in silent prayer. I feel at home here. I pray and I write. The days are too short. I am very calm and I am happy and satisfied. On March 12th, Titus was transferred to the notorious penal depot at Amersfoort in Holland. On their arrival, the guards led the prisoners to the camp courtyard and ordered them to stand in the freezing rain. Titus stood there in dignified defiance. After several hours, the prisoners were led to a dressing room and given a numbered prison uniform. But before they could dress, they were taken, still naked, back into the freezing rain. Finally, they were herded into barracks and allowed to put on their prison uniforms. Titus had become a number. Now, I am number 58. I am assigned to a work detail in the forest. My fellow prisoners and I are poorly equipped for cutting trees and removing stumps. We often fall exhausted. The camp is terribly overcrowded. Some of the men have become disabled with dysentery and other diseases. Others have been taken away in trucks, and they have never returned. On Hitler's birthday, prison authorities gave amnesty to some prisoners. Titus was not among them, but one of the released prisoners brought word to the Carmelites of Titus's condition. I told the fathers at the monastery that Father Titus was in good spirits. He especially showed great concern for his fellow prisoners. I've seen him give up a portion of his meager rations to help other starving prisoners. He shows great concern for the Jews. Titus defied the rules, and on Good Friday gathered some of the prisoners and led them through Christ's Passion and the Stations of the Cross. He silently made the sign of the cross on their hands with his thumb. I still ask my fellow prisoners to pray for our captors. They find this very difficult to do in the face of their unbearable situation. I urge them gently and say, you don't have to pray for them all day. 
Even though Titus urged his fellow prisoners to pray for their captors, this became impossible for them when on Easter Sunday, 76 members of the Dutch underground were sentenced to death. The other prisoners were forced to stand silently facing the condemned men for over two hours. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Titus prayed and signaled to the condemned by folding his hands and pointing to heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In late April, the Gestapo sent for Titus for further interrogation. Captain Hardigan once again was his interrogator. To all his questions, Titus repeated his original statements. We have decided that you will be transferred to Dachau. There you will stay until the end of the war. Dachau was one of the Nazis' most brutal concentration camps. Hundreds of thousands of people entered, but few left. Titus's calmness and gentleness infuriated his captors. He was beaten unmercifully. They kicked, punched, and gouged him, often leaving him dazed in the mud. Of the 2,000 Polish priests imprisoned there, 850 died. We have a chapel here at Dachau where mass is said. Unfortunately, none of the prisoners, myself included, are allowed to attend. A Capuchin friar was able to smuggle a small portion of the Blessed Sacrament to me, and I have it hidden in my glass case. A guard stopped Titus, threw him to the ground, and kicked him unmercifully. Titus kept one arm clenched tightly to his body. He managed to crawl away to his bunk. A fellow Carmelite prisoner came to comfort him. Thank you, brother, but don't pity me. I had Jesus with me in the Eucharist. Titus, already suffering uremic poisoning, contracted a severe foot infection. The sandals he still wore caused his feet to blister and fill with pus. In spite of his terrible condition, he remained even tempered and cheerful. He spoke to his fellow prisoners. Do not yield to hatred. Be patient. We are here in a dark tunnel, but we have to go on. At the end, the eternal light is shining for us. In his last letter home, Titus wrote, With me, everything is fine. You have to get used to new situations. With God's help, this is working out all right. Don't worry too much about me. In Christ, your Anno. Titus knew his days were few. He knew that the hospital was the final end for many prisoners. There they died indescribable deaths. But Titus had no choice in the matter. He too was taken to the hospital in mid-July. On July 26, 1942, Father Titus Bransma was injected with a deadly drug. Within minutes, he was dead.